Good morning, SoFlo Church. I'm so glad you're all here this weekend. Honestly, uh, I was a man of little faith this morning, knowing it was the beginning of spring break for some of you. I thought it'd be crickets here, and yet here you are. So way to go. I'm glad I'm not uh, the only one that's here. It's gonna continue to be a really, really uh, great day. Last weekend, uh, we began this new series called 168, uh, the week that changed forever. And some of you I know are like, what does 168 mean? You wanna find out? That's how many hours are in a week, okay? So now you know. You don't have to be in the mystery anymore. You're like, oh, that's what I thought. No, you didn't. Uh, so 168, the week that changed forever. And, and we're looking at the last week of Jesus' life. Now, now we said last week that um, Jesus lived on earth approximately 33 years. And yet what we find in Scripture, in writings called the Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, they're the writings that specifically tell the story of Jesus' life and ministry, that much of the ink in the Gospels is used telling about his final week. You know, we as people tend to get very fixated on, on baby Jesus and understand why. Like, babies are really, really cute. There's some really cute babies in this room right now. We're so glad they're here. Like, we love baby Jesus, especially at Christmas. We get fixated, consumed with baby Jesus, and baby Jesus is great, but you may be surprised Scripture spends very little time on baby Jesus. In fact, there's only two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, that even take the time mentioning the birth of Jesus. It just kind of races forward into his life. We've said that if you could like, flip through Jesus's personal scrapbook, and wouldn't that be fun? there's me walking on water. Like, it'd be really fun to look at his personal scrapbook, but you'd find like, you know, the first several pages, first several sections, like completely blank, like, Mary, why didn't you take any pictures? But then it's like you get to the end of his life and there's more and more and more documentation. And then you get to the final week of his life and it's like the flash bulbs were always popping, like almost every moment is being documented. And so what we're doing as a church between now and Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that's only a few weekends away, we're just taking a behind the scenes look at the final week of Jesus's life. So if you have a Bible with you or if you have a Bible app on your phone or one of your devices, uh, turn in there to the Gospel of John. You'd find John in the second part of the Bible we call the New Testament. Now, now John, we're gonna be in chapter 13. John was written by a man named, I bet you can guess, John, yeah, it was written by John. You're like theologians out there. It was written by John. John was uh, one of Jesus' best friends and one of his followers. And, and I know some of you, uh, for the first time, been reading the Gospel of John. It is incredible and gives some amazing insight into the life of Jesus. And, and, and one of the pictures he gives us in the Gospel of John is this inside look at this meal, this intimate meal that Jesus shared with his followers near the end of his life. So John chapter 13, as it begins, it is, it is Thursday night. He is in his final week, and it's Thursday night. He's gathered somewhere in Jerusalem in, in what they called an upper room. So it was just a, a borrowed room somewhere. He's gathered with his disciples, sharing the, this very, very intimate Passover meal. It was just about three days ago now that Jesus had entered into the city riding on the back of a borrowed donkey, and we, we know that that was imagery. Uh, he was claiming to be king by riding in on the back of a donkey, and, and maybe you remember people had gathered around him, and they laid cloaks on the ground for him, his donkey to walk over, and they were chanting his name. They were screaming for him, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Remember what they were really screaming is, Jesus, save us now. We, we need to be saved. That, that was just a few days ago. It was, it was probably yesterday that Jesus had um, stormed into the, the temple of all places, kind of like a place like this, stormed into the temple like in a temper tantrum or what my kids call being a rage monster. Like he was turning over tables, he was cracking whips. Yes, Jesus sometimes has that demeanor and disposition, especially when people are being exploited and people being exploited should also make us be angry. And so Jesus saw people being exploited. He was very, very angry. That was, that was probably yesterday and, and now, now, it's, now it's Thursday night. This last week is going very quickly. The sand in the hourglass is running out. In a few hours from right now, Jesus, he's, he's gonna be arrested. He's gonna be put on trial. We're gonna talk about that next weekend. He's gonna be beat, and then he's going to be crucified. On this Thursday night, time is running out. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not. Maybe, maybe you have, but, but when time in life is running out, Time gets focused, life gets focused very, very quickly. As a pastor, I can't tell you how many times that I've 
I've stood in a room. I've stood at a bedside where someone had weeks, sometimes days, sometimes hours or minutes left to live. And I don't know how to explain it to you besides that in those moments, life gets really clear. The hugs get tighter. The words get sweeter. The conversations go deeper. When you are running out of time, you cannot afford to waste words and people don't. In those moments, life gets very, very focused. And so as we study John chapter 13 and we watch Jesus and we listen to Jesus, you've got to do it through those lenses, knowing that in this moment, Thursday night at this meal, uh, there, is, there is very little oxygen left in his lungs, very few breaths more he's going to take. His time is running out. His purpose and his passion is going to be shown more clearly than ever before in his ministry. John 13 verse 1 says, It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Let me stop there for just a moment. We'll we'll move faster later. Let me stop there, though, because if if you don't understand the implications of something that was just said, we're going to miss out on a whole lot of of what's going to happen here at the end of Jesus' life. So, So let me explain the Gospel of John to you a bit this way, that as you read through the Gospel of John from beginning to end, I hope you will, you would begin to notice there are several themes woven throughout his writing. His gospel is very different than the other gospels. Like one of the themes you would find in the gospel of John, if you're paying attention, is darkness and light. And if you didn't know any better, you would think, well, I mean, that's just surface level stuff. There's no like theology going on there, but you get one layer below the surface, you find you're swimming in the deep end of theology. In the Gospel of John, darkness represents evil. Light, when it is represented or mentioned, it represents good. And here's what I know is if you're in a pitch black stadium, 70,000 seats, pitch black, you you stand at the 50-yard line and you light one match, you're going to see that light in all corners. That flame, that flicker is going to dance all across that darkness. Why? Because light always overcomes darkness. It makes sense why in John chapter eight, Jesus said this about himself, I am the light of the world. In other words, the world may be dark and it may be dreary, but I have overcome the world. And so in John, you're gonna gonna see things like this show up. Pay attention when you notice things happening again and again. One of the themes that shows up in John is this issue of time. It shows up there in the verse I just read when it said Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave. On the surface, again, it doesn't seem to be much of a theological statement. You get below, and time's a really, really big deal. Three times in the Gospel of John, at least, Jesus is going to be recorded as saying, my my time has not yet come. And so Jesus, he's just talking about time all the time. And you're you're like, man, the dude's like always pulling his phone out, looking at his clock. He's always checking his, his, you know, Apple Watch. Like, man, he's really focused on time. But but when Jesus was talking about time, it it was rarely a conversation about minutes and seconds. He he had something deeper and greater going on in his mind. And so you, you just have to know in the Greek language that that was the language of their day, there was at least two words for time. One of them was chronos, It's where we get chronology. It's the time we know about. It's like we measure the time. We keep track of time. Very sadly, it's the way many of our lives are dominated by by chronos time. But, But then there's a time called kairos time. And kairos is is like right here, right now. It's a sort of time that refuses to be reduced down to the tick of the clock. It's like, you can't control me that way. You can't measure me that way. And so it's always living in the moment. Here's what it is, Kairos, really. It's, it's living to the beat of a supernatural drum. Something deeper and more is going on. That's the story, really, of how Jesus lived. So just hours from now, again, we're back on Thursday night. Just hours from now, Jesus is going to be taken into custody. He's going to be arrested. He's gonna be mocked, he's gonna be abused, he's gonna be put on court, it's all a sham, but he's gonna be put on these court trials again and again. And and as you read these events taking place in the Gospels, it's gonna seem like everything around him is just unraveling at the seams. It's gonna seem like Jesus, poor Jesus, is completely helpless, like everything's totally out of his control. Even in the darkest moment you're gonna see coming soon in the next few weeks when Jesus is hanging on a cross, dying in the most humiliating, painful fashion you could ever die in this world, he was completely in 
control. There was nothing around him that was out of control. The Bible actually tells us that if he wanted to, Jesus could have called down 12 legions of angels, that 72,000 angels who were just waiting for his voice in heaven, like, we're coming, Jesus, you let us know. They would have come down, swooped in, grabbed him off of the cross, rescued his life. He could have, but he didn't. And it's this reason here is that when he was on the cross dying, he wasn't like a just a random casualty in in a tragic event like a drive-by shooting where someone just happens to die. That is not as what's going on. Jesus is gonna be willingly sacrificing his life. Jesus, when he went to the cross, please understand what happened. Jesus did not go to the cross against his will. He went to the cross according to his will. Like you could say it this way, that, that the arrest and the persecution and even the crucifixion, it was not an interruption into his divine schedule. It was his divine schedule. At that one cross, on that one hill, on that one Friday afternoon, it was reserved for him before time ever began. First Peter chapter one, verse 18 says, Peter wrote this, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world. So though Jesus was not confined to the tick of the clock, like he made his own schedule, when he's talking about here, my time has come, he also is now talking about Friday afternoon, like his time is coming and he knows it and he chose it. And so on on Thursday evening, he knew, man, time's running out. And so verse two says that the evening meal was being served. In the first century, uh, they, they had some unique traditions compared to what we have now. And, and one of the traditions is that before you ate an evening meal, uh, you had your feet washed. And it, it was very necessary. Like their mode of transportation was uh, not cars and not fast trains or airplanes or buses. They, they walked almost everywhere they went. And, and the roads were not covered in asphalt or potholes like ours. Like, okay, their roads, they were, they were dusty and, and they walked. And so their feet were, were, were cracked and broken and, and blistered and just, just ugly, they were, they were dirty. And the disciples, Jesus and his followers, they were, they were no exception. Like they were part of an itinerant ministry, meaning they, they traveled and they, they moved and they, they walked a lot. Their, their feet were very, very dirty. And so it's like, okay, feet were dirty, but, but why would they need to be washed before you had your meal? Like, how about eat and then get all happy and good and then get your feet washed? Well, here's the thing is that when, when they had a meal in that day, the way they gathered around the table, it wasn't like now where you pulled up a stool or you pulled up a chair. Uh, the tables they gathered around, they were about 18 inches off the ground. So you didn't sit at the table, you reclined at the table, so you kind of like lean back on your elbow. I'm not gonna lay down for you right now, okay? But just envision this. You kind of like lean back on your elbow. Your feet were extended out near the face of the person next to you. So if you were invited for a group meal, you had to pray very hard. You were not gonna be seated next to a middle school boy because that would ruin the whole night. I have two of them in my home. Trust me, it's a horrible experience, all right? Like you, didn't, you did not want that at your meal or nothing would be appetizing. So the, the cleaning, it was ceremonial, but, but it was also just like hygiene. You need to have, you need to have your, your feet washed. Now, the washing was done by a servant and not just any servant, but it'd be the lowest servant in the household who would do the foot washing. Why? Because that's disgusting. And so it'd be the lowest servant in the household that washed the feet. But this room that they're in, having this meal, this, this is a borrowed room. I Meaning there's, there's probably not servants like hanging out, just like waiting to do something. And, and so there's no servants, there's, there's no one around that would immediately jump up and wash feet. So you would think that one of these disciples, like they're hungry, they wanna eat, like we gotta do the foot washing first. You would think one of them, some of them would have jumped up from the table, grabbed the basin and the towel and started washing the feet so they could eat, but they didn't. And we actually know why. Because we know from scripture that either before or like right at the beginning of the meal, the disciples, Jesus' friends, they were actually wrapped up in a pretty heated discussion amongst themselves. And Luke 22 tells us that the discussion they were having amongst themselves, these Jesus followers, was which one of them was the greatest. Hard to imagine a group of men having that conversation, right? <laughs> if I've been in the room, I would love to tell you 
that I would have immediately jumped up from the table while they were having the conversation about greatness and I would have just gone around the room washing feet. I would love to tell you that, but that would probably be a lie. It's not true and it's probably not true about you either. The reality of it is, in this culture, but really almost in any culture, I'm sure, we are just wired to to look out for number one, to stand up for our rights, to make sure we exaggerate our strengths, to minimize our weaknesses, to do whatever we've gotta do to make sure we're at the top and our name is, is etched into the plaque. And so if I was in the room that night, I'm pretty confident that I would have been right in the middle of the conversation, maybe even leading the conversation, and I probably wouldn't have been the only one. Some of us, we'd have been just very bold about it, like number one, that's this guy right here. Like somebody just would have called it out. Others of you, maybe a little more passive aggressive, would have taken the false humility approach. The greatest one is not me. No, it could not possibly be me, but I'm gonna keep talking about me. <laughs> like, however you would have gotten to the conversation, most of us would have been right in the middle of the conversation about which one of us was the greatest. And so none of them bothered to grab the basin and the towel because that would have been a sign of weakness and that would have ruined their argument about being the greatest one in the room. And so it was in the midst of this debate about which one of them is the greatest, Jesus, he stood up from the table. And they may not have noticed him at first stand up from the table. Again, they were wrapped up in the conversation. They were too busy like presenting their case of why they were great. They may not have noticed him get up from the table, but it would not have taken them long to notice what he was doing. Verse three, it says, Jesus knew the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his face. I'm not sure if this conversation about greatness, it had been in like screaming tones or if it had been in hushed whispers. I, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm pretty confident though. Uh, when Jesus got up from the table and, and took off the outer clothing and wrapped the towel around his waist, uh, there was a deafening silence that sat into the room. When Jesus took the outer clothing and wrapped around his waist and then, and then got the towel, he wasn't doing a costume change. He was taking the very posture of a servant, when a servant was about to wash the feet, that's what they do. They would take off their outer clothing. They were just in a loincloth, which is kind of weird, but that's what they did. And then they had a towel so they could dry the feet after they washed the feet. Now, the imagery did not need to be explained to the disciples. They had seen this being done hundreds of times. And so the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I feel pretty certain when Jesus gets up from the table, he takes off the outer cloak. He wraps the towel around his waist like these disciples, they are angry, they're confused. They are frustrated and they're embarrassed all at once. They understood the imagery of what he was doing, but they, what they would have been asking themselves is, Jesus, what are you doing? They, they, they knew and he knew that, that foot washing was reserved for the lowest servant in the household and, and they saw him as many, many things. They didn't see him as that. They saw him as friend. And they saw him as as their Lord, and they saw him as a, as a rabbi, and they saw him as a miracle worker, like he could do some amazing things. They'd seen him do some incredible things, but nothing like this. And so they've gotta be thinking, Jesus, what are you doing? What they didn't realize is Jesus was about to respond to their conversation about greatness. He was about to paint them a portrait of what it looks, what it looks like to be great, not with his words, but with his actions. And so verse five tells us that after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And so get this, see what's happening. On a Thursday evening, somewhere in an upper room in this amazing city of Jerusalem, creator washed the feet of his creation. And I, again, I don't know, but, but I'm assuming that, that as he goes around the room, that um, these, these disciples, they're, they're just silent. Because what do, you, what do you say, right? But Peter, if you know anything about Peter, Jesus' friend and follower, he, he was never at a loss for words. So he's like, I gotta say something. He always had to say something. So he's like, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. Peter said, no, you, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands as well. So it, it, what, this is Peter being Peter, poor guy. In one sense, Peter goes from saying, you're never gonna wash me 
to, I want a full body sponge bath, please. Like that's just sort of how Peter was like, oh, Peter, I can't wait to meet him in heaven. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> I think Jesus can be like, Peter, shh. <laughs> Anyways, that, that, that's Peter. And, and so listen, but Peter, he, did, he didn't really understand everything that Jesus was saying and doing, but, but we don't usually either. Like when Jesus says things and does things, there, there's a whole lot usually happening. And, and that's true in John 13. So in John 13, on a very, very practical level, the top layer of what's happening, Jesus is painting a portrait of what it is to be great. Because understand this, please, like there, there's nothing wrong with greatness. Like I would say, be great, all right? Like we should all want to be great. It's just that here and in other places, Jesus tells us what it actually means to be great. And so I brought this white robe because, in a sense, this white robe is a picture of what it would mean for us to be great. Like, when you check in to a five-star hotel, there's going to be one of these hanging in the closet of the room waiting for you. Or so I've been told. Because the hotels where I stay, I'm lucky if there's soap in the shower. But I've been told that if you stay in a nice hotel, like more than two and a half stars, you might have one of these in the room for you. So you get in there, and, and I'm not gonna put this on mostly because it's a woman's robe. But you know, there's a robe in there, and, and there's, you know, there's sandals in there waiting for you as well. And if you have the white robe on, you know what this experience is like. It could be room service. You're not worried about how much that room service costs. You're just worried about how quick it's going to get there. And, and you get to have steak or shrimp or lobster. And there's, later on, there's going to be the spa treatment. And there's going to be a massage. And, and, and you can just kind of have whatever you want. You're not going to have to go downstairs to sit in the hot tub because you probably have a hot tub in your room. <laughs> like Some of you are like, yes, it does at the places I stay. Again, the Holiday Inn does not have that, but it sounds really good. And so, But you got this white robe on, and it just you've arrived in a place, man. You're entitled. Like, you're good... And it just, and there's nothing wrong with staying at a wonderful place like that. I would love to do that one day. My point is the white robe, what it does is it symbolizes the way we view greatness. That you've arrived in a spot of life where you can be entitled to everything and anything, a place of life where you're gonna be applauded, a place of life where you can spend most of your time being served. And, and Jesus turned all of that upside down on its head. Like, Jesus, think about this. If there's anyone who could have rightfully lived a white robe life, it was Jesus. Because he just happened to be God in the flesh. Like, he could have lived that life. Jesus could have been born in a golden palace for all the world to see. Instead, he was born in the back of a borrowed stall for animals. He could have worn uh, clothes that were made by the finest designers of the day, Gucci. There was a first century Gucci, I'm sure, and he could have worn that instead. He maybe owned the shirt on his back. He could have find, dined at the finest establishments around. Instead, he spent most of his time just like hanging out with this ragtag group of, of former fishermen. He, he could have had a security detail. He could have uh, had an entourage that, you know, held his umbrella when it rained and shined his sandals and carried his luggage. Like he could have had all of that instead. He, he could have had this white robe life. Like he was entitled to it more than anyone. He could have had Jesus Christ etched into like the, the you know, the wrist there and right up here on the chest. Instead, he chose the life of the basin and the towel. I mean, he totally just changed the picture of what it looks like. In fact, one time Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He said, the son of man, that's, he's talking about himself, did not come to be served, but to serve. And, and so in John 13, as Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, he's saying, hey, hey, greatness, it's not about being served, it's about serving. And later in the passage, Jesus even said, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, at SoFlo Church, we want to do everything we can to emulate the life and posture of Jesus. So I'm excited to share with you that next week, starting next week, that every single time we gather, we're going to have a time where we take off our socks and shoes and sandals and wash each other's feet. No, we're not, because my feet are stinky and disgusting, and so are yours. I've seen some of them this morning. We are not going to, hey, you need to put those away. We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that, okay? You're like, I'm never coming back. We're not gonna do that. You know, some people read this passage and take it hyper literally. Like, oh, like, we just gotta wash feet all the time. Okay, you do that, all right? And you do your thing, but we're not gonna be there, all right? So, but, but, but it's not really 
hyper literal. Like this passage, most scholars and just like followers of Jesus would agree, this isn't about like a specific outward action. This is more about an inward posture that you just live with the basin of how life. I read a story about an oil executive who was traveling in, in Southeast Asia, a very impoverished area. And, and somewhere while he was traveling along there, he encountered a Christian missionary and he sees this Christian missionary tending and bandaging the open, oozing wounds of a dying leper. And disgusted, he turned away and just thought he mumbled under his breath and said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And the Christian missionary, young woman, heard him say that and she turned and said, sir, neither would I. And that's the words and that's the posture of a basin and a towel life. And, and so the question is, what about me? And what about you? Like we living, uh, always chasing after, always wearing the white robe, figuratively speaking, or life with the basin and the towel. And we'd be remiss to not use this opportunity to really get practical and kind of answer that question. And so let me just ask you a few examples. So, so in the family, is it, you got the white robe on, you're always waiting and hoping and setting yourself up to be served maybe by your spouse or, or maybe by your children, or, or you're like, no, 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 in the family, I got, I got the basin and the towel. And so think about this, like at, like at mealtime, are, are you always the first one to eat? <laughs> or do you help and kind of make sure, especially if you have kids, that everyone's got what they need and all the, all the meat's cut up and everything's given away be, before you also sit down and eat? Or maybe at nighttime, maybe you have some little children and when one of the children is you know, struggling to sleep or they're sick or they're restless and just having insomnia, like are you quick to get up out of the bed and, and go and tend to the child and be with the child and maybe clean up the mess or do you lay quietly in your bed pretending to be asleep knowing that if you're quiet enough, he or she will get up again? This is not a time of confession or pointing. Please stop, okay? This is, this is a time, and now we're gonna need marriage counseling later today. This, this is a time of just honest reflection that in the family, whatever your family structure looks like, are you, do you have the white robe on and everyone knows we've, we've gotta make sure they're good? Or do you have the basin, do you have the basin and the towel? Or at work. And you're like, work? At work, I'm there to work. What do you mean at work? Okay, but listen, as followers of Jesus, we're just actually servants living in disguise no matter what you do for work. So at work, we're still called to serve if you follow Jesus. And so at work, I mean, is it you're always doing everything you can uh, to elevate yourself, even at the expense of others? Or are you always working to try to elevate someone else, sometimes even at your own expense? Are you the last one to get there and the first one to leave? Or do you arrive when the work is beginning and you try to stay till the work is getting finished up? The, the conference table, is that a place for you to be seen and heard? Or is it a place for you to listen and to learn and to grow? And even, even right here at church, you're like, church, what? That's where I am right now. Yeah, like at, at church, I mean, how do you view it? Do you got a white robe on or, or do you have a basin and a towel? Now hear me, there's, there's a time and a place absolutely at church to be served. There's all kinds of ways that we can serve people here at the church, but we all have to ask, you know, do, do we occasionally also wear the apron? Do we also have the basin and the towel where we're serving others? And that question should not at all create guilt. It's, it's about a paradigm shift, realizing what this kind of community is. Like we've often said, we, don't want to, we, we want to be an all-hands-on-deck approach here where it's not just a few of us always serving the rest of us, but it's all of us occasionally having the opportunity to serve everyone else. And, and, and so in your school, in your friend circle, in, in your neighborhood, is it, man, I'm wearing the white robe or I'm, I've got the basin and the towel ready to serve anyone, anytime, in any way. In John 13, Jesus in no uncertain terms, he calls us to put this down in the chase of this, and it's hard, because I meant it's nice when you got the robe on, and then pick up this. And yet, interestingly, uh, there's a passage in Revelation chapter seven that's got the subtitle on it that says this. It says, the great multitude in white robes. Listen to this, Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. It's speaking about the heavenly days. John writes, actually, John wrote this as well. He said, after this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Every nation, every tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the lamb. They were wearing white robes. They were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And then on down in verse 14, we read the reason the robes were white. It says they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, 
They're before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they be hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. In this twist of irony, the Bible teaches that when you live with the basin and the towel, you end up wearing the white robe. And so in John 13, Jesus is absolutely like, like calling us into a life of service, but there's more going on. And, and as I think through this scenario in that room on that Thursday night, my mind just always wonders, what was it like? Literally, what was it like when Jesus went around that room washing the dirty feet of his disciples? In just a few hours, in his greatest moment of need, when he's being beaten, when they're preparing him for crucifixion, one of his closest friends, Peter, the guy I talked about earlier, Peter, he's gonna deny even knowing Jesus, not just one time, but three times. He's like, Jesus, I don't, I don't even know what Jesus, what you, you think I know him? That's gonna happen in a few hours and Jesus kneels in front of his feet and washes his feet. And, and Peter, honestly, kind of gets the bad rap. They're like, well, Peter denied Jesus. Yeah, but he wasn't any worse than the other 11. Like, they didn't deny knowing him. They just abandoned him instead. They ran scared away from Jesus. And so they didn't deny him like in the same way, but they, they denied him with their actions. And, and yet he just goes around the room, person by person by person, and they just, just washing their feet. He knows what's about to happen. He's just washing their feet. And, and honestly, I can sort of begin to rationalize Jesus washing their feet, but I'm gonna be honest with you where I struggle, Judas. Judas, by this moment, this night, Judas, he, he, he's already made the plans to sell Jesus out. He's already made the arrangements. He's told them where Jesus is gonna be and when Jesus is gonna be here. And then you can come and just arrest him and I'll, I'll make sure to you know, kiss him on the cheek so you know who it is, even though they already knew who he would be. For 30 pieces of silver, he has sold out Jesus that's gonna lead to the crucifixion. And, and, and for many years, I would read this passage and I'd be upset that Jesus washed Judas's feet. It's like, no, you need to at least skip over Judas. Jesus, you need to do that. But then I've changed my perspective over the years because I've realized, I think I know what it was like. I, I think I realized what it was like for him to wash Judas's filthy feet even though he already knew about his filthy sin. And I think it was something like when he died on the cross for me, even though he already knew about all my filthy sin. See, I don't know about you, but, and I'm, I'll openly say this, I have sold Jesus out on multiple occasions for a whole lot less than 30 pieces of silver. I've done it for cheap thrill. I've done it for small financial gain. I've got it for a little lie that makes myself look better than I really am. You understand, don't you, that what Jesus did on, on Thursday night, it was really foreshadowing of what he was about to do on Friday afternoon for everyone. Like Thursday night, he sketched the picture of greatness. On Friday, he added in shades of red. Like it was Thursday that he washed filthy feet with a cloth. It was on Friday that he washed filthy sin with his own blood. And, and there are some of you that would say, I would never let him wash me. I am way too filled with shame. I'm way too messy. I'm a, I'm a disaster. I'm, I'm, I could never do that. Or, or Jesus, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Instead, I'm going to like get myself cleaned up and then I'll come to you, Jesus. A whole lot of people take that approach. Like, no, 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 let me, let me do me. Let me clean myself up. Then I'll go to Jesus. But remember what Jesus said to Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And so as we leave the upper room, what I would just ask all of you, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, is have you let Jesus wash you? Not your feet, but your souls. Later on that very night, Jesus is gonna say to his disciples, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And some of you right now, you're on a spiritual journey. I've gotten to know you. I've been in conversations with you. Man, you guys are all over the place in terms of your, your faith, and I love that. That's what we want SoFlo Church to be all about. There's space for everyone. You can belong here before you believe. Like, wherever you are, I know some of you, you're like, man, I'm looking, I'm looking for a way. Life's not working out. I'm looking for a way. I'm looking for the truth. If there is a truth, I don't even know if there's truth, but I'm looking for truth. I'm looking for a more abundant, joy-filled life. That's what I'm looking for. And the world, our culture, social media, was just laying out all these options for you of how those desires could be satisfied. It's like, there's all kinds of options. And you're, you're being told just like, hey, be true to yourself. Listen to your heart. 
do what makes sense to you. All spiritual paths, they all end up leading to the same place anyway. So you just pick one and it's gonna be fine. And I'm just, I'm just telling you, because I care about all of you, that, that, that in the midst of that noise, and listen, that's all well-intentioned noise, Jesus would still say the same thing today that he said then. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus would just say to you, your soul needs to be cleansed, and I'm the only one that can clean it. Not only can I clean it, I wanna clean it. If you've already allowed Jesus to clean you, meaning you've already acknowledged the reality of sin and brokenness in your life and, and you've been baptized into Christ and that sin has all been washed away, I hope that today you'll have a renewed sense of gratitude. That you'll just have like this overwhelming sense of constant gratitude and joy, remembering that your soul, like mine, mine more than yours, was just spoiled and soiled with the muck and mire of sin of every kind. And Jesus did what only he could ever do. The Bible describes it this way. He washed you, get this, he washed you as white as pure snow. You, be grateful. And if you haven't allowed Jesus to cleanse you, to wash you, then I would just say, don't, don't keep waiting. Remember what Jesus said again, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So don't let pride get in the way. Humble yourself and let Jesus do what only he could do and what he wants to do, to wash you, to cleanse you as white as snow. Not only can he do it, but he wants to do it. Get this, this is very, very important. Not only can he do it, but he wants to do it. Not because you are good, because he is good because he is good, because he is good. We go through this life and we keep saying, no, I'm a pretty good person. No, he's a pretty good person. And he can make you whole and well and clean. And just as he tenderly bowed in front of the feet of his disciples to wash their feet, he went to the cross to cleanse your soul forever. He's really, really good. Let him do what he so wants to do. Let me pray for you. God, I and we, I believe, are just humbled by your goodness. Lord, I often revisit that room on that Thursday night and I just, I, I'm stunned that you scrubbed their feet. What a lowly task. But you didn't hesitate. You didn't apologize. You didn't make a spectacle of it. You just showed them and us how to live. God, in our life, we, we just really believe, we still do, that greatness is all about going higher and more and stuff and higher and higher and higher, whatever. And you said, no, 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 no. Greatness is about willingly going lower so others can be lifted up. Lord, let us be a church that lives that way. Let us be a church that loves that way. And let us also be a church that doesn't waste what you did on the cross on that Friday afternoon, that we don't look at it and think, man, what a loving thing he did. But we can say, thank you, God, for doing that for me and for us. And Lord, the very reason we exist as a church is, is we believe that's the source of hope. We wanna unleash that hope in this whole community and beyond. And Lord, I know there's people in this very room right now and those that'll be listening online who have, who have never just said, Jesus, yeah, do what you can do. Just make me as white as snow, wash my sin away, breathe a new life into me, Lord. And we just pray that you'd be moving and stirring in a powerful way, drawing people to you. God, thank you that you are so good. I am not good at all, God, but you are so, so good. And so we gather in this place and Lord, we also share this meal we're about to share. And we do it in your name, amen.